this crazy story out of Canton, Massachusetts. Man. So this story, when I first, I, I remember when I first saw this story last year, I, I don't know. I remember looking at it. Obviously I look at stories like this and I just didn't have a take on it. Like when I, I remember going to, I remember seeing the, the headlines that a Boston police officer was run over in a driveway by his girlfriend in a snowstorm and that she didn't realize she had done it until afterwards. And I went on her LinkedIn and I'm like, I remember looking at her thing. I'm like, Oh man, this woman's sharp. You know, normally you don't expect that. Like college educated works at a university, uh, appear work good with numbers. Like you'd probably want to hire her. And it's like, but everybody makes mistakes. You know, anyone could have too much to drink and just heat of the moment, do something like that. And I think that's kind of how it was portrayed. So I didn't really have an opinion. So I, I don't write about stories that I don't have strong opinions on. But I remember seeing the story and I just didn't have that strong of a, an opinion on it. But something about it just didn't smell right. Uh, and it just seemed like, like it was at the home of a Boston police officer. Obviously the Boston police officers are going to kill another Boston police officer. And I felt bad for her when I saw it, like on the news, I'm like, man, that sucks. This woman, you know, has her shit together and she just got drunk one night and appears to have not even known that she backed this guy over. I'm sure she didn't mean to kill him and I'm sure it's eating her up inside, but that was not the case at all. And so let's just kind of chronicle our way through the story, relive it if we can. So on the morning of January 29th, John O'Keefe, a veteran, I think he was on the force for 16 years, Boston police officer, uh, was found dead outside of a home at 34 Fairview Road in Canton. The home belonged to Brian Albert and his wife. Brian Albert is a sergeant in the Boston Police Department who serves on the Fugitive Apprehension Unit, which... Uh, according to Boston police officer I spoke with, that's like the gig, the gig. You want that one? It's it's a good lifestyle, good money. Uh, you know, it's fun. You get to go track down the bad guys. And he's been on that show, Boston's Finest, I think it was called. Um, I never watched it, but he was on there. So he's he's pretty well known, and I'm I'm told that he's connected. He's one of Marty's people, Marty Walsh, and. You know, you, it, politics in the Boston police, Depart police department's ugly. Like, if you don't have the right people that have your back, they're going to get you. Like, ask um, Matt Morrissey, a uh, police officer who got, you know, they, they stalked him for like over a year to see if he was violating the city's residency requirements for Boston Police Department. Uh, and I don't know where John O'Keefe stood in that hierarchy of the Boston Police Department, but it wasn't as high as Brian Alberts, I think. Uh, he seemed to be more protected. So O'Keefe's girlfriend, Karen Reed, ends up getting charged with manslaughter because she reportedly backed over him after a fight. That was the narrative that was put out there after a night of drinking. Uh, she was widely castigated as a cop killing villain, right? And maybe she was an easy person to dislike for a lot of people because, you know, you look at her, she's attractive and, uh, you know, has her shit together. Maybe... Maybe people looked at her as elitist. I don't know how they looked at her, but for some reason, I remember this coming out and people, it was, people thought she was like an easy villain somehow to dislike people like a villain. That's different from all the other villains. And they're like, see, I, I differentiate. I like all villains. You know, it's like, I, I don't like her just because she looks nice. Doesn't mean that she's a nice person. And I think that's the mentality that a lot of people had when they went into this. But anyway, uh, as it would turn out, at least, at least by my count, I did a count of this. There was at least 11 other people that were in that house. And he was, what we know for goddamn sure, 100% was she did not run him over. We know that for several reasons. Number one, the most obvious one is you don't have six lacerations on your arm. You don't have two black eyes. You aren't bleeding out of your mouth and your nose. If you get bumped going slowly during a three-point turn, how are you going to kill someone doing it like that? 
I mean, I, I suppose it would take like a freak landing, but you're not going to, I mean, with those injuries, that made no sense. How that alone was not the biggest red flag that something is not right here is insane to me. Like that makes no sense. They immediately just went with the narrative that she did it and they worked from there. They, they didn't even consider anyone else because as we're going to see, the people, when I say they, it's really one state trooper and he was covering for the whole thing and he had, he was going to make sure that the, the right person was put behind bars and she was the right person. So the cover up was aided and embedded by uh, the state police, or at least one trooper who, by the way, can we talk about how Michael Proctor, why was he even on that? Like, why was he even assigned that duty? He doesn't do homicides. How many homicides has Michael Proctor done in his tenure as a, I believe the state police have a homicide unit. Do they not? Why is this guy working homicides? That's interesting. Who put, like, who, who delegated that? Remember, this is an organization, the state police, that we exposed six years ago for massive corruption when they orchestrated uh, what is now known as Troopergate, and they redacted the arrest report for a judge's daughter, Ali Bebo. And then when two troopers did not want to participate in that, they were reprimanded for being good cops. So apparently nothing's changed. We kept hearing about reform. But we, we still have shitty troopers, at least, but at least they're jabbed. But they got that going for them. They got jabbed. So anyway, the cover-up, as I said, was aided and abetted by the state police, for sure, the Canton Police Department. Although, I do want to point out that this story, in my opinion, does not get told without rogue, anonymous Canton Police Department members who spoke up quietly. I think the people at the top of the Canton Police Department, the chief, as we saw, I don't know if he planted evidence, but he was driving by one day and just saw it. So that was weird. And the deputy chief lives across the street, but the ring camera, he said, didn't pick up anything interesting. Somehow, there's no trees. It's like the wide open landscape didn't pick up anything. I think those guys at the top were shady, but I think a lot of... Uh, rank of file, punch in, punch out. Can police officers were like, "Fuck this, I'm saying something," and they spoke. Now I don't know who they reached out to first, but all I'm saying is suddenly out of nowhere, Karen Reed's defense attorneys had a shitload of information to work with and like knew everything immediately. Like knew everything. Like their court documents i suppose they're part theory but the details put into that are like those are coming from someone someone in the know is, is giving them those details so this woman and and i kind of ended it with this I, it, in the norfolk county da's office i'm kind of tied on what their complicity in this i understand it's their job to get convictions but and I, I don't really know how this works. And maybe a lawyer can fill me in on this about like, what is, if, if they know that this evidence exists out there, like, did they know this evidence existed? Cause Trooper Proctor did and may, and went through a lot of hoops to make sure that it, it wasn't given to the defense, but the, the Norfolk County DA's office know this stuff was out there. That's still a little bit confusing to me, but as I ended the year, I said, this is the story of one woman alone facing down some of the most powerful, well-protected people in the state who sought to destroy her life and exonerate herself. And I've never spoken to this woman before. Maybe I will someday. I'd really like to meet her um, because I'm impressed by her. Because I, if I were her, I would be depressed, right? I would, I would be scared. Now, I didn't speak to her, but I spoke to people who knew her. Let's just put it that way. And I, I'm like, is she scared? And they go, no, she's not. She's confident. She's confident. She's a confident woman. She's not worried. Like she knows she didn't do this. And she's more going on the offensive now to show who did do it. And you're right. Blurred lines. Thank God she had like what happened. Like luckily she could hire high priced attorneys from Los Angeles to come here with the Latin term pro hoc vice. 
and practice law in our state. And really, I mean, those guys were the real detectives. <laughs> those guys did everything. Uh, I mean, get yourself the lawyers that she had. Holy shit. They got everything. And this will be dismissed. I'm sure of that. This is not going to go to trial. This is going to be dismissed. I can't imagine the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office will object to a motion to dismiss at this point. How can they? I don't know what their argument would be for that. But then, but then what? We'll get to that. We'll get to like the ideas about what can happen now if it's too late. They no longer, they sold the house last week, dude. Sold the house last week. That's crazy. So, you know, I'm just really impressed by the way that she, by herself, took down and exposed a, a, a huge conspiracy of people who were determined to destroy her life in order to save their own. And she's going to win. And that's impressive. So there they are. Uh, they were on again, off again, I believe, couple. They've known each other for like 20 years. Um, and he has a niece and a nephew who he adopted from his um, I don't know if it was sister or his brother. But both parents passed away in a period of six months. And so, I mean, that's horrific. He stepped into the plate. He uh, fought for guardianship. His mother, who I believe he is estranged from or has hardly any relationship with, also applied for custody. He won. And so he is uncle. They call him Uncle John, um, but he was basically their father at that point. And I, my understanding is she's kind of like the stepmother, right? They lived in a home in uh, the town of Canton. She owned property in Mansfield that she rented out. So. And I would imagine if she lives there every day, she was, I mean, wouldn't, it's not like a stepmom, I guess. Uh, and it's really sad because the kids believe her to be a killer and um, they have no relationship now. And that's, I hope that can be fixed. Uh, I don't know how old they are, but anyway, uh, there she is being arrested uh, and charged. She spent a grand total of two nights in jail. She is out on bail for $100,000, and the trooper who was in charge of writing up this report was Michael Proctor, and he touted his resume in here. As he says, I'm a Massachusetts State Police officer, um, isn't it a trooper, uh, and I have been a police officer since 2013. I am presently assigned to the State Police Detective Unit at the Norfolk County DA's office. So this, I am the state police detective unit. It doesn't say anything about like homicide in here at the Norfolk County district attorney's office. Like, so how did he get assigned? I've investigated and processed serious and violent crimes, including, so he has done murder before, but I don't know. I don't know how that works anyway. So she's charged with manslaughter, motor vehicle homicide by negligent operation and leaving the scene of a personal injury. So this is, trooper proctor these people just have i don't know why they do it they just have this desire to i don't know if it's to be liked or what but they also have like no conscience like how do you allow this woman like how do they wake up every day knowing that this woman is facing whatever 20 years in prison and is likely to be found guilty and you know it's not true you know who killed them you were there. How do you wake up every day and just go through your life like that? I couldn't do it. They found 11 people in the same place that were willing to do that. 11 people. And I'm sorry, if I'm in a house with friends and one of them kills someone and they're like, family meeting, y'all, we're going to conspire to do something. They're like, oh. You're correction. You're going to do that. I'm telling the cops what really happened when they asked me about it. So that I'm all set. I'm not doing, I didn't kill him. <laughs> that was stupid. Shouldn't have done that. Shouldn't have done that. Oops. Who brought this moron? Couldn't control his temper. So anyway, the charging documents state that two Canton officers were dispatched at 6 04 AM on January 29th to 34 Fairview road, where they found three females, Karen Reed, 
Jennifer McCabe and Carrie Roberts next to the body of John O'Keefe. Reed was performing CPR at the time. So this is um, Jennifer McCabe on the right and her sister, Nicole Albert, on the left. Nicole Albert is the wife of Brian Albert, who lived at the house at 34 Fairview Road. Um, the other one's husband, uh, Jennifer. There's so many names in this, dude. I had so many questions last night. Like, it took me eight hours to write this blog because because of the names alone and figuring out who the hell was who and getting pictures and whatever. So, th so she's married to a guy named Matthew McCabe. I'm not entirely sure what Matthew does for work or what his involvement in this is, but it was just weird that of the two sisters, the one that seemed most dedicated to making sure that Brian Albert remained not guilty, you know, not arrested was uh, Jennifer McCabe. Anyway, uh, this whole thing, I'm like wondering about, I'm like, why is this woman so invested in it? Now, I don't print rumors, so, but I will say that the rumors going around, I mean, I think I said in the blog, like, do the math. I mean, what do you guys think? Why was Jennifer McCabe so invested in her brother-in-law's covering up her brother-in-law's crimes, her sister's husband? Like, what, what does that seem like to you guys? Gen genuine question. I mean, th that seems to be what a lot of people would assume. No? I mean, that would be the guess. Now, obviously, I don't print rumors. Uh, and we'll get to the motive, uh, why this would happen. I don't think there was a motive, to be perfectly honest with you. I don't think there was a motive. I think you didn't like him. Uh, and, I, and we'll get to why that happened in a little bit. And I think it got out of control. And I think Brian Albert jumped in to defend his nephew and he's a trained MMA fighter and anybody who knows a dog owner like that, if you have an aggressive German shepherd, the German shepherd is going to attack whoever you're attacking. So that's really like two against one and a beast. At least that is to assume that Brian Higgins did not get involved in this or any of the other males there or Brian Albert jr. And anyone else there. We'll see. Um, all of this should have been investigated, but none of it was. So, as I said, this guy was, uh, this is Brian Albert. He was a MMA fighter, uh, Boston fugitive apprehension unit. He looks like, like every cop ever, you know, it, it reminds me of like, I think of uh, breaking bad. And so this would be like, okay. So if Brian Albert is, even though he looks like Hank, Brian Albert is, um, Walt, he's Walt in this situation. Right. And like Skylar covers for Walt because that's her husband. But Marie doesn't. Marie doesn't even like Walt. But in this case, Marie is like banging Walt. I mean, not banging. Maybe. That's what people think. Marie is like the more, more concerned one. It's a weird dynamic that they have going on here, isn't it? Jeez. So anyway, um, at 11.30 a.m., so this is much midday, Trooper Proctor interviews Jennifer McCabe and her husband, Matthew McCabe. They tell him that they were at the waterfall bar in Canton where Jennifer met up with their friend, John O'Keefe. So again, a little confusing because, you know, you assume two Boston cops, they know each other. They don't really know each other, or at least not well. Uh, the people who know each other, Jennifer McCabe is friends with John O'Keefe. And Karen Reed is an outsider. She doesn't really know any of these people that well, except through John, who barely knows anybody except for Jennifer to begin with. So they all meet up for drinks. And according to Jennifer, she said that uh, Karen Reed walks into the bar carrying a vodka soda drink and a glass. What kind of bar do you know that lets you bring in an outside drink into the bar? First of all, that's trashy. Okay. You're like a sloppy 19 year old on a bar crawl on St. Patrick's day. That's what that sounds like to me. And what, so I don't, I don't believe that happened. And Karen Reed denies that happened. So why would you lie about that? Because I think she's trying to paint the bigger picture here that Karen Reed was wasted.
That is what the, they're trying to push here. She was making stupid decisions all night, and this was one of many, and it culminated in the death of John O'Keefe. So, um, I don't believe that happened. So, these three grown adults in their 40s, which is, go to an after party, okay? Okay. Af after party? How old is Like, after party? That's really, I've, the only one I respect here is Karen Reed, because she's like, no. I'm I'm 40 year old woman. I don't go to after parties. Like, what kind of shit is this? You going to frat or something? After we gotta play beer pong with a bunch of kids. That's what it sounds like. It was like Brian Albert Jr.'s birthday or something. So they're gonna go to the after party there around 12:30. And Jennifer got there first, and she said that she witnessed Karen Reed drive up in her black Lexus SUV. And since O'Keefe only knew McCabe in the house. He texted her to make sure she was there or else that'd be a little bit awkward, wouldn't it? And Jennifer claimed that O'Keefe never entered the house though. So she texted him hello at 1245. And then she said she witnessed Karen drive away in her black SUV. Now, so she's claiming that she just assumed that John got back in the car with Karen and left. It's like, so you're making plans to have this guy over and then you don't, and he, and he gets, he comes all the way there. He's like, I'm outside. He just doesn't come inside and you don't follow up on that. You just assume he went home. So remember, that's an important detail. Remember, Jennifer McCabe believes, according to police, she believes at 1245 AM that John O'Keefe has gone home to bed. That is where she believes John O'Keefe is. Remember that, because that's very important when we come to the Google search. That is what she told police her state of mind is. It conflicts with her behavior, doesn't it? So, um, so there's that. So Jennifer claimed that the SUV never entered the house, or that O'Keefe never entered the house, so she texted him, blah, 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 blah. Okay, she told Proctor she had assumed uh, that he had gone home. She then received a phone call from a distraught Karen at 4.53 a.m. looking for O'Keefe. So Karen goes home. So people are like, why did she go home? People thought that was strange. Well, she doesn't really know anyone there, and she's a grown-ass woman, and she probably doesn't really like these people. They don't seem like her kind of people. And so she just, eh, I don't feel good. I'm just going to go home. The guy lives three miles from there. He can get his own ride home. He'll figure it out, take an Uber, whatever. He'll be fine. No biggie. And so she's, but she's waiting for him. She's like, he'll be home in like an hour or two, right? That's what you'd assume, maybe two hours. Um, but he doesn't come home. And she's texting him and she's calling him. And by 4.53, now she's worried because this guy would never not come home because he has two adopted children there who need him. He's never spent the night like away from them like that. So, I mean, these kids have already lost two parents. Now they lost an uncle. Imagine that, how much those kids have suffered. Horrible. So Trooper Proctor, uh, she told uh, Trooper Proctor that uh, she had offered to help Karen look for O'Keefe, along with O'Keefe's friend, Carrie Roberts. And we'll get to the details of that later. Now, the Carrie Roberts thing, I had a lot of questions about because I'm like, so Carrie Roberts was a friend of O'Keefe and I think an acquaintance of Karen Reed. But I don't think she was good friends with, she wasn't at the party and I don't think she was tight with McCabe. I could get that a little bit confusing there. Uh, I think she was tight with, I don't know if she's tight with him, but whatever. That's her right there. And that's John O'Keefe. So she definitely friends with him. So she wants to help out. So Karen's too hysterical to drive at this point, And she's all worried. And so kind of uh, Jennifer kind of quarterbacks the whole thing. And they're like, we'll, we'll all go looking together. Even though she really doesn't know her that well. And also, why are you awake right now? You've been partying all night. It's 4.50, whatever, in the morning. Why are you awake? That We're going to get to that. And according to Jennifer, she says that during the ride, Karen starts asking and saying, could I have hit him? Did I hit him? Now, when I read this last year, I remember reading this last year and thinking, oh, man, that's a shitty thing for a friend to do. Implicate another friend like that. 
but I guess it happened. It's, you know, that's tough. You got to tell the police what your friend did. Um, but as it turns out, they're not friends. She was trying to destroy her life the entire time. So she picks her up and, you know, why would she ask that? Now I believe that these people were so effective at that sh they convinced her that she might have done this. Like, did I? It's like she's asking, she's not saying I did it. She's saying, did I do this? Did I hit him? Could I have hit him? She also told the state police that Karen's SUV had a cracked taillight, which at the time would be true. At that time, it would be true. Uh, the two of them then jumped into Carrie Roberts' car and they drove back to 34 Fairview Road. When they got there, Karen immediately noticed O'Keefe's body, but the other two did not. I find this is very important because it had not snowed that much. It had not accumulated. It was snowing out, but it wasn't the, the kind that stuck. So there is no way that the other two couldn't have noticed his body but they pretended not to. And that's what makes me wonder about Carrie Roberts. I'm like, so she, I can understand Jennifer McCabe. She's in on the cover up, but Carrie, what's the old Carrie Roberts? Did she, like, she couldn't see it, but this woman does. And that was by design. Karen, Jennifer McCabe was in the car with her because she wanted to control the narrative that would be told to police. She wanted to be there. She wanted to say, oh, we didn't notice the body, but she did probably because she killed him. Probably because she knows where she hit him. Probably. Like, this is all design. So the two of them then jumped into Carrie's car, and blah, 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 blah. And so she gets off first, immediately starts hysterically crying. Her She leaves her phone on when it happens. And I guess some of this was recorded. And she starts performing CPR on him. Again, he's bleeding everywhere. Um, I believe, I, I don't know if we have a time of death for this, uh, but he'd probably been dead for several hours. I'm guessing. So Trooper Proctor believed that Karen knew exactly where the body would be because, uh, she ran over him, left him there to die. That's what the state police think. That's what they're going to operate on. Now, this is why you shouldn't talk to cop. If you're a suspect in a crime, don't talk to a cop without a lawyer. You don't have to. So why would you? They have their narrative ahead of time. They're not going into this with like an open mind about like, hmm, I wonder maybe and this isn't like a game of clue. And you're trying to figure out if it was Professor Plum in the conservatory, right? This is like, you know, going into it, it was goddamn Colonel Mustard in the kitchen and I'm going to prove it. And I'm not even going to consider any other possibilities. And that's what they're trying to do here. So um, O'Keefe's arm, as I said, had. Uh, Six lacerations, eye swollen shut, and black and blue. Okay, I'm sorry. You obviously do not get that from being lightly backed into an, oh, I'm dead. Six cuts on my arm, bleeding out of my face. Okay, covered in vomit. That, 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 that happens from a light, you know, three point turn. A medical examiner said that he had two. Swollen black eyes, a cut on the left side of his nose, a two-inch laceration in the back of the head, and multiple skull fractures, dude. Skull fractures. So that makes no sense. So there's no possible way these could have happened from Karen nudging him. Carrie Roberts told Trooper Proctor that Karen Reed was drunk and hysterical when she saw her at 5 a.m. and stated that she was so drunk she didn't even remember going there. She repeated the same story as Jennifer that Karen made statements suggesting that she may have accidentally hit him or got him by a plow. So that's why I'm reading this. I'm like, is Carrie Roberts in on this? I can't tell. At 4.30 p.m., Trooper Proctor claimed that he went to the home claimed. And I broke claimed in all letters there because normally when you read a police report, you believe the police to be telling the truth. But Trooper Proctor is a liar. He is a proven liar, a very deceitful man. So anything he says, I take with a grain of salt. So according to him, he claimed that he went to the home of Karen's parents in Dighton and claimed to have observed Karen's SUV parked in the driveway with a shattered light. 
Proctor interviewed her and Karen denied bringing a drink into the waterfall bar. She said that she dropped O'Keefe off at the bar at around uh, at the party at around 1215, but left because she didn't know anyone there. Well, she wasn't feeling sick and she's a grown ass woman in her forties. who doesn't go to after parties. So she, li- she lived with O'Keefe less than three miles away. So getting home wouldn't be a problem, blah, blah, blah. She never saw O'Keefe. She ne- so she drops him off, but never sees him go inside the house. Uh, and had no idea that she had a broken taillight. And so this is kind of why she believes it. She doesn't know how she got the broken taillight. The ring camera later shows that she backed into John's car when she went out looking for him. She never saw him going into the house. So she's thinking in her head, maybe I did hit him. You know, maybe I did. And she she's the only person here with a conscience. So she feels bad. So she lived um, not far away and blah, 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 blah. Okay. Karen attempted to call and text O'Keefe multiple times after dropping him off. But and, and in one of the messages, I guess she was like, where the fuck are you? You know, because she's worried. I would do the same. I would be like, dude, you're because I, I would be pissed. I, I would assume that you're alive, right? Because you're angry. You don't think they're dead. You think they're alive. And you're like, dude, you're scaring the fucking shit out of me. Can you answer the phone? What's your fucking problem? It's like that. Like you, you would get mad. If your spouse didn't answer the phone because they're worrying you, she doesn't actually think he's dead. She's mad at him for worrying her. And so that is a perfectly lot, but that's not, of course, that's not how police go into it. They're like looking for evidence. They have a checklist of shit. Like, have you been in any fights recently? Whatever you do, don't tell them about your most recent fight. It's, it's not going to make you, I know to you it probably makes you sound like a normal couple. You fought over breakfast or something. That's not, that's not what they're going to use it for. They're going to use it to incriminate you. Stop talking to cops without lawyers. When you're involved in a death, don't talk to cops. This is a, from someone who supports police. Don't talk to cops. If you're ever a suspect in a murder without an attorney present, you don't have to. So why would you nothing like you're not going to win them over. You're not going to convince them. They've made up their mind already. So, um, he would never come uh, home knowing his niece and nephew needed him in the morning. He would always come home. Um, Trooper Proctor asked her leading questions designed to incriminate her. We kind of went over this, the breakfast thing. Blah, blah, blah. A Canton firefighter who responded to the scene uh, told Proctor that Karen said to her friend, quote, I hit him several times. So, again... Mission accomplished for Jennifer McCabe. Her job was to put it in the head of Karen Reed that you did this. And so she's like, did I hit him? Oh my God, I hit him, I hit him. She's crying. Think of the guilt she had. Think of the guilt. Proctor's report also states that two red pieces of a taillight were next to O'Keefe's body, which was the final piece of evidence needed to charge her with manslaughter. Proctor's report also states that there's two red pieces of a taillight were near O'Keefe's body, which is the final uh, piece of evidence. And that obviously indicates that she backed into him and uh, that's all they need to get the manslaughter charge. Except in the original report, it never stated what time the glass was found. This document above is slightly altered. This is weird. Proctor has, there's two different versions of this report. This is the altered one. The original one contained this picture. And I mean, look at the snow here. How many, how many inches of snow is this? How many inches of snow? Two, three inches. It was one of those like nasty snowstorms where it just snow just blew everywhere and it's cold as balls, but it didn't really stick. It was like icy, like the worst kind. And there is no way that Jennifer McCabe would not see a body there. How could she not see a body? Makes no sense. None. But Trooper Proctor never once mentioned that he was close personal friends with McCabe and the Albert family, which is a very prominent name in Canton. I've been told that there has been a deleting spree in the last 24 hours, which is remarkable because all of these accusations that I went over and all of these pictures that we're going to look at were mentioned 
in September 2022 court filings. They had to have known about them and they kept the images up. But then Turtle Boy comes along and I write about it. And the next thing you know, everyone erases themselves from the internet. This blog today, uh, we are going to get a quarter of a million page views today. That's what we're on page four right now. A quarter of a million page views. So I guess that was all it took. For, uh, but again, I'm not a court of law. I'm just a blogger. I'm a journalist, an award-winning one, but still I'm a journalist. I'm not a judge. You would think that the court filings being out there would be reason enough to remove these images, but they're so cocky that they stayed up. They stayed up. So these images were on uh, Trooper Proctor's sister's Facebook page. And this girl in the pink is Jennifer McCabe's kid. So he has a close relationship, we can assume, with Jennifer McCabe, who, whose story was taken at face value. That's Proctor's sister. Um, in the back there, I believe, is Chris Albert. Chris Albert is a selectman, a recently elected selectman in the town of Canton. It's unknown if Chris Albert was at the, um, if, if Chris Albert was at the, uh, uh, the party, we don't know because the geofence stuff has been obstructed by Proctor. So we don't know if Chris Albert was one of the people in the house. Tonight, so we have to operate in the assumption that he was not, but uh, Chris Albert lives at Seven Meadows Avenue in Canton, two doors down from John O'Keefe, who lives at One Meadows Ave. His son, Colin Albert, was an 18-year-old senior at Canton High School at the time of the incident, and he definitely was in the house that night. And he's a big kid. He's a real meathead. There he is right there. And there's his two brothers. I think he's the middle child and there's his old man, Chris Albert. Now, Colin was a star football player. He has since taken down his Facebook uh, or his Twitter account. Let's see if, if Canton high school has taken down there still. Let's see. And it's gone. It's gone. Yeah. So that, that picture has gone. <laughs> so Colin Albert, uh, it was the star football player and captain for, the high school team, I believe is BSU. That would probably be Bridgewater, I'm guessing. But don't hold me to that. Real meathead. Real meathead. Every picture of him. He actually had a tweet up about this, how like every picture of him has the middle finger up. Real hardo, this kid. Real hardo. And he's like your prototypical throwback, you know, 90s bro jock, it seems. Captain of the football team. Learning's like wicked gay dude. Like doesn't have like time for that. He said Shakespeare was a huge loser. <laughs> that was his take on Shakespeare. Shakespeare was probably a loser. Probably got a lot more chicks than you did, my dude. Just saying. Anyway, um, there he is drinking Dylan Mulvaney light. And here he is at the prom. All right, ready? So these are all my friends, and um, yeah, we're just having a fun time at Senior Prom. Go dogs! <laughs> okay. So there he is with uh, Boston Police Sergeant Brian Albert, his uncle. Now, his other uncle, Kevin Albert, is also a Canton police officer. And Chris was recently, as I mentioned, elected to the board of Selackman. This picture is from Uncle Tim Albert's Facebook. The Uncle Tim appears to be the loser of the family who gets by on the name while contributing nothing to the legend of it. Um, okay, uh, I'll check those donors in a second. The man in the middle, uh, as I said, is Tim Albert, blah, blah, blah. So Trooper Proctor's family knew Colin Albert since he was a little boy. So this is... um. The profile picks that is Colin Albert right there. So the guy, the trooper investigating this has known Colin Albert since he was a little kid. 
You don't think he's going to be protective of him over that? There they are. This is her wedding. He appears to have been some sort of, I don't know if he was like the, what do they call the boy? The ring bearer? It looks like he's the ring bearer. I'm guessing. Why else would he be in this picture? And there's Proctor over there. Yikes. Not once did it ever occur to Proctor that, hey, maybe I should tell them that I know these people really well. He, 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 this is They're not acquaintances. Like, dude, you're at their weddings. You go to family events where, the, where where cake is served. If you're going to a cake event, you're like a, a close person to them. And he also failed, you know, this is a well-connected family that he is in charge of investigating. And he's already reached his conclusion because the only person he doesn't know is Karen Reed. So she can burn for all he cares. And he's in possession of all the evidence related to this crime by himself. Somehow he just gets it all. I don't know if any other troopers were around when he took her car, but he decided that, um, you know, the only person really going to be investigated here is Karen Reed. So how about this picture? Colin Albert likes to get in fights and boast about it. So I did not have, I wasn't sure of the exact date of this because I don't really understand how Visco works. I guess it's what all the kids are doing these days. And this picture uh, was posted on, uh, Colin Albert's Visco account. Not long after John O'Keefe was killed. And as you can see there, his knuckles. Look at those things. Scraped. Now, what if I told you that this picture was taken on February 26th? Would that change anything? February 26 this image was taken that would be four weeks almost or maybe exactly four weeks after john um john o'keefe was killed those cuts right there i mean i can tell you like i don't think anyone would debate those cuts right there come from punching something or someone and bleeding everywhere however it looks like the the cuts are so fresh and the scabs are so fresh that i can't imagine those could have come from hitting John O'Keefe, right? I mean, that would be pretty brazen if he did that. But it also indicates he punched something. So apparently this kid just goes around punching things he doesn't like. Let's see, those are healing cuts. Could be brass knuckle. He doesn't seem like a brass knuckle guy. If Has anyone Googled if his knuckles would look like? No, I have not. I'd, I'd be curious to know the answer to that. I'd be curious to know the answer to that. You're not, I mean, you're not, he's not playing football in February. It's not going to be football. So anyway, uh, four weeks is a wicked long time. Still show any kind of damage though. Unless he just goes around getting in fights. I mean, that's what I picture. I'm like, if that's not from John O'Keefe, it's from something. Like I could picture this guy like smashing five natty lights and then like punching a wall. He's mad because his girl don't call him back. You know, text me back. Fucking pissed, bro. Boom. Watch him. He punched his wall. I can picture that happening. But um, scabs get itchy too. Yeah, that could happen. So that, I mean, those are big scars though. That's like hard to miss. None of this was made public. The Norfolk County DA's office has, hasn't said the mountain of exculpatory evidence to Karen Reed's defense attorney until recently. This evidence proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that she had nothing to do with his death, but someone did. Okay. And I think the ones that we know are implicated in the death or we can assume are Brian Albert, Brian Albert's dog, Colin Albert. And obviously Jennifer McCabe didn't kill him. But she was quarterbacking the cover-up, wasn't she? So, they all decided to frame her afterwards. Now, um, let's think about this for a moment. Let's just think about this for a moment. Okay, imagine yourself in that home. This is what I believe happened and what most people believe happened. A lot of people are saying, what is the motive here? Well, uh, the Colin Albert is a neighbor of John O'Keefe. And from what people tell me, my sources tell me, 
he was a huge dick and he would uh, throw shit on his lawn, yell at him, I, which is insane. Like who goes around as an 18 year old picking fights with the neighbor, especially a neighbor who's a cop. I don't know what John O'Keefe's personality was like. If he was combative too, if he fought back, I don't know. But they didn't like each other, um, at least. But that's just weird, don't you think? Like, normally 18-year-olds have beef with other 18-year-olds. Not grown-ass men who live down the street. That's weird. So, but he didn't like him. And so John O'Keefe went into that house. That we know. He went into that house. And how do we know that? Because of his phone. Duh. His phone pinged. Now his phone pinged going up three flights of stairs. Or two flights of stairs to the third floor. You can't do that in a car. You can't go up two flights of stairs in a car. So if the location was off by a few feet. and oh, Okay, he was, he was actually in the driveway. Well, he didn't, you know, hover. He had to go walk upstairs to do that. Now, I'm wondering, I'm like, so this guy gets to the party. And he's like, can I get the grand tour? Can you, can you show me the third floor, sir? I find that hard to believe. So what's my theory in this? I think he was chased. I think a fight broke out and I think he ran away and they tracked him down and beat the shit out of him. That's what I think happened. Because why? Who, who goes to the third floor in a, a house that you don't even really know them? Seriously. That makes no, so the, the mere fact that we know undoubtedly, undoubtedly that John O'Keefe stepped foot in that house immediately proves, immediately proves that Jennifer McCabe is lying. That's the, like immediately proves she's a liar. Nothing she says from that point on can be trusted because you lied about the most important thing that he came into the house and you said he didn't come into the house. You lied about that. Why'd you lie about that? Because she wanted to blame it all on Karen Reed. That's all it came down to. So the guy goes into the house and people, someone just sent me a message about this. Who's what's, what's this one? Oh God. Okay. Somebody saying that Colin Albert was seen by peers at school on January 30th and was not seemingly different in behavior following the incident. Keep that in mind as well. Yeah, I, I, I will keep that in mind. You know what that indicates? That he's a psychopath. <laughs> the, the fact that he could go to school the next day and be normal indicates to me that he's a psychopath. That's what that, that means nothing to me. Nothing. Even, even if he didn't kill him, he was at a house where he saw a dead body. Actually, presumably, right? He was at a house where somebody died and he just wasn't affected at all. I see why they would suspect him, but a typical high school kid, you can assume, would be going crazy covering up the murder. I don't think you understand how the mind of a psychopath works, sir. That's just my opinion. So anyway, the he, my theory is he goes into the house and immediately Chris Albert starts talking shit to him. He's like, fuck you. You know, you, you, you fucking, you don't want me you're yelling at me for speeding down the street or something. Who knows what he yelled at him for? And John O'Keefe is like, yeah, you're a fucking asshole maybe. And I think that, Al, I mean, Albert is big. He's strong for an 18 year old. And I think he started hitting him. And I'm sure it hurts when he hit you. And I think that Brian Albert jumped in because he's going to side with his nephew who he's very close to. And he doesn't really know O'Keefe that well. And in doing that, the dog gets jumped in. And I think happened is when he walked in immediately, he's confrontational with them. A fight ensues. I think he's dead within 10 minutes. That's my guess. Um, and I think he's dead by 1255. That's my guess. And the dog chewed him up. And I think that they just hit him so much. I mean, who, who expects someone to die from a fight? You know, a lot of people begin to fight. You don't expect the other person to die. 
But again, Brian Albert possessed the ability to kill you with his hands because he is a trained fighter. And according to sources, Colin used to trespass on John's property all the time. Colin's parents egged John on about these confrontations too. I mean, it just seems like a bad neighbors didn't like each other. And the son was just the dickhead. I mean, I know what teenage, I mean, I got taken to court by a 16 year old two weeks ago, a brat, you know, so I, I, I know what teenagers are capable of doing when they're in peak dickhead mode, which this guy seems to always be in. But I think that they, in my opinion, my theory is that uh, they killed, he definitely died in the house. And I think they did not, there's no way that they, they intended to kill him. If you're, you're not going to do a premeditated murder with all these people in the house. Like, yeah, let's invite you over and you guys can all watch us do this ritual killing. Yeah, that'll be fun. Then we'll clean it up and we'll call it a day. That's not going to happen. So this was a surprise. All of a sudden in the home of a Boston police officer is a dead body. Also of a Boston police officer. What do you do in that situation when you're these people? There in that house, by my count, was still, you had Brian Albert Jr., Caitlin Albert, Brian Albert, Nicole Albert, Jennifer McCabe, Matthew McCabe. You had the Nagel girl, her friend. You had, I forgot the the friend's name. You also had um, Brian Higgins, ATF agent, who has an office in the Canton Police Department. O'Keefe and a few others, okay? So what do you do in that situation if you guys were in there? Like, how? what do you do? I mean, this was unexpected. All of a sudden, there's a dead body in your house. So what do you do? Well, Brian Albert, I think, would be the most, and Brian, Brian Albert and Brian Higgins would be the two most equipped to know what to do here because at least Brian Albert's probably done some homicides. And he knows how the investigations work. And immediately they're going to come up with a plan. Now, there had to be some sort of threat involved here. Because how do you get 11 people to keep their mouth shut about a homicide that they just witnessed? Fear is the only thing. Now, I understand it was family, but not everyone was family. The Nagel girl was not family. How'd they shut her up? How'd they shut her friend up? Or did they? Were they the leaks? Were they the ones that spoke with Canton police officers? And then Canton police officers anonymously told defense attorneys, we don't know. But there had to be some sort of come to Jesus moment there where Brian Albert and probably Brian Higgins made it clear everyone here is to shut the fuck up forever and we will take care of you. If you don't, we're all going down. So they got a dead body on their hands there. They can't make this thing disappear. They can't chop him up or anything because Karen Reed knows that he's there. She's going to want to know. Like you can't. So they, they have to do something. And they're like, it must have clicked with them. Blame her. She was drunk, right? Here's what we're going to say. And he put Jennifer McCabe in charge of getting close to her, of going and you're going to go and you're going to help her with the search. You're you're not going to leave her. You're going to be with her when she discovers the body. She's going to discover the body, not you. She's going to discover the body. And where did she do the three point turn? That's where we're going to put the body. And sources tell me that they believe that Brian Higgins was involved in moving that body out of there. That's what sort of my very, very reliable sources on this case are telling me that he was, in, he was involved in moving the body and placing it there. So by 1.30, less than an hour after John O'Keefe went in the house, everyone's gone. The party's over. What kind of after party lasts 45 minutes? They all just leave. They're gone. And they all go their separate ways. 
why would you do that if there if there was not like a buzz kill like a murder that happened there? Why would everyone just leave? That makes no sense. So there, I mean, that's what freaks me out is that there must have been some sort of meeting immediately afterwards. And that they all came to the agreement, all of them, that were like, she's expendable. Because who the fuck is she? We don't really know her. We've we've all, everyone here knows each other for a long time. We're family. We're part of this community. We don't know her. She probably sucks anyway. I guarantee they were trying to justify it. They're probably being like, she's uppity. She thinks she's too good for us anyway. She couldn't even come here. You know, John didn't even like her. I'm sure they were, I'm sure they were saying shit like that. They were, because they would have to rationalize harming this woman because that is exactly what they were going to do is harm this woman. So unfortunately for them, Karen Reed is an extremely intelligent and well-resourced woman who can afford world-class representation. Her attorneys filed a motion demanding forensic audit of Jennifer McCabe and Brian Albert's cell phones for all communications before and after the death. When they received the information last week, they got this. Inf- they've been looking for this for a long time. They finally got it. Picture the jaw drop moment when her attorney and her read these messages. Picture the light bulb moment of elation that they had when they saw these messages. That they withheld these for over a year. Uh, as I said, he's a highly trained fighter, blah, blah, blah. Actually, we'll get to the, what the mess. Oh, the, it said, how long to die in cold? At 2.27, she Googled that. We're going to go over the timeline for that in a moment. Now, this guy lives across the street, Tom Kelleher. I don't know if he's the new chief now, but the other guy, the guy that showed up at the scene of the crime miraculously and found some shards of glass, he recently retired too. I didn't even put that in the story. I found out afterwards. He recently retired too. So this guy, the deputy, lives across the street. And that's his home right there. And across the street, where I circled over here, is the home of Brian Albert. There's no trees here. He's got a ring camera in his door. Dude. A ring camera is going to catch this. It's going to catch this. It's definitely going to catch sound. There is a lot of movement there. A body is dumped there. It's going to catch that. Anyone who has a ring camera knows that. But he tells police, I, uh, I'm told, I don't have nothing suspicious on there. And they trust him because he's a cop. He's a cop. So, of course, they trust him. It was not subpoenaed. So Jennifer McCabe uh, searched how long to die in cold and then deleted all communications between herself and Albert. Deleted it all. But when you do that, you know, it's forever. Like there's a digital trail. They're going to get it. But she, you know, figured that she was good. And she took calculated steps to make sure that this was all covered up. And this is the attorney's paperwork that he filed in court. Again, these, this is his theory about what happened. So this is not, we don't know this as a beyond, like, you know, definitively. But this is what made sense to him. And it's what makes sense to me too. And I think to a lot of people. So, okay, questions here. If Jennifer McCabe did not think that it was unusual for John O'Keefe to leave, like he did. Remember, she's like, he showed up and then he just left. Then why did she stay up until 5 a.m. awaiting Karen Reed's phone call about O'Keefe being missing? That's that's a big one. Remember, she thought, she told police that she assumed that he went home to bed. Why would she think anything was wrong? Why would she think anything is wrong? Why would she wait up? Why? What on earth is she worried about? If she thinks he's home sleeping, that makes no sense. If she had nothing to hide, then why is she destroying all these communications? 
Why is she more con- uh, committed to protecting Brian? I got to change that. Brian, it's supposed to say Brian Albert. Brian Roberts was the old second baseman for the Orioles. Then her sister, Nicole, who is married to Brian, who isn't mentioned in any of this shit for some reason. After O'Keefe got to Albert's home, he began texting McCabe to make sure that she was there. Alex Bolio sends $1, says for Vok here. Photo of his knuckles is from February 4th? February 4th? How do you know that, Mr. Bolio? That, if that picture is February 4th, and they can get metadata on that picture, which they would, that, ladies and gentlemen, if that's true, that changes everything. That is like, holy shit. If that is February 4th, that would be less than a week afterwards, wouldn't it? That would be crazy. Let me read a couple of cash uh, uh, turtle chats here. Shana sends $20 and says, what, what you do is important. And I truly believe someday you'll get the recognition and platform you deserve. Well, thank you very much. And you know what, Shana, even if I'm just, I'll just build my own damn platform if I don't have to. So thank you. Uh, Paul sends $10. He says, Turtle Boy is the number one news in New England. Destroy this group of scum. Well, thank you, Seth. Appreciate that. Dan sends $25. says, I want to take uh, this lecture. (laughs) I see what he's saying here. I want to take this opportunity to lecture you on the importance of owning and training a firearm. Just kidding, man. Seriously, man. Thank you for what you do. I'm a huge fan and supporter. Thank you. I, I had a little tweet rage about that. I'm so sick of people telling me to get my LTC and get a gun. Like I get it. I just don't want, I don't like guns. I'm, I'll be, a, I'm, I'm not afraid of guns. I got my rifle shooting merit badge in the scouts. I'm actually really good with the rifle, but I like leaving my rifle at the range. I just, I don't want a gun in my house, man. I don't like him. I don't feel comfortable with a gun in my house. I leave shit lying around, man. I can never find the remote ever. I never know where the remote is ever or my cell phone. I always have to call it with my other phone. I don't like guns. I don't like guns. So it's just a personal choice. And I think uh, like the right to, I believe in the right to own a gun. I'm a second amendment supporter. I'm also a supporter of the right not to own a gun. I think that's an important right that often gets overlooked with the, you know, the gun diehards. They're like, you don't own a gun. It's like, bro, I don't want one. Can you give me, I, and like, I got way more threats than you do. And I still don't want one. So how about that? Okay. That's just my personal choice. So there we go. Um, anyway, um, another dono here from, uh, so I appreciate that. Dan, uh, Kathleen sends $25 and says, great job. Dr. Turtle boy. Thank you. Appreciate that. I like the doctor. Um, Anita buff buff Okay. All the chicks with, no gag reflexes. Holler at your boy. 71. Okay. I'm not going to read. Okay. I'm not going to read that. I can't dox that phone number, but okay. Um, at least for $5. I can't Fubar sends $50 says rock on. We live in a corrupt world. Stay safe. Thank you. Fubar. And Marcus sends $25 says you do great work. I appreciate that. Marcus. Uh, if anyone else would like to donate my cash app is dollar sign uncle turtle boy. And the a link at the top is for turtle chat. You can donate whatever you want and you can, um, you know, do that. Was it, was this confirmed with her cell phone records? If not further proves he was already, yeah, we'll get to some of that. Okay. Um, so let's go back to this. So, um, after O'Keefe got to Albert's home, he began texting McCabe to make sure that she was there since she was the only person he knew when he entered, he was surprised to see 18 year old Colin Albert. He did not know Colin, Colin Albert was going to be there. I'm sure it was unpleasant seeing him there. At some point punches were thrown. Our sources believe that Brian Albert joined in on the beating, alarming the German shepherd and immediately began tearing into him. Now, the dog, which was six years old, the dog's name was Chloe. It was the family dog. They just got rid of the dog. This got rid of it. They rehomed it. They didn't like put it in the woods and say, you know, you're a wolf now, but they, they got, they rehomed the dog. Who does that with a six year old healthy dog? Who does that? Well, the dog is evidence now, is it not? 
the dog is evidence because I suppose that they would be able to tie those lacerations on his arm to the dog, wouldn't they? So that's interesting. He also sold his goddamn house once the heat started coming on here. Put his house in the market. We'll get to that. That's pretty shady. Okay. Um, definitely in the house uh, that night were Brian Albert, Nicole Albert, Brian Albert Jr., Caitlin Albert, Jennifer and Matthew McCabe Six, um, Julie Nagel, Sarah Levinson, Brian Higgins. Oh, that only ends nine. That's only nine. Why did I think it was 11? O'Keefe would have made 10 at minimum, I guess. So this right here is uh, Higgins, the ATF agent. He's a former firefighter, I believe, um, with O'Keefe. One witness. Um, so that means that all of them witnessed this murder or are aware of it and have said nothing. Most of them, to my knowledge, were not questioned by Trooper Proctor. I mean, don't you think that's crazy that he didn't even consider any other pot? Like, after you see the body, and that's how you know Proctor's a piece of shit and a corrupt asshole, is because he find, he's not stupid. He sees the body, he sees the, the, the bite marks, and he sees the skull fractures. He's like, this doesn't come backing over you during a three-point. No, that's not going to happen. He knows that something else happened here and he did not pursue it at all. That the, the actual crime scene was never once searched. That house is probably covered, covered in John O'Keefe's DNA. It's probably everywhere. It's probably got blood everywhere. You cannot get rid of blood. It's invisible. You'll never get rid of it. Everyone gets caught with blood when they kill someone inside of a home. You can't get rid of it. There's going to be DNA everywhere. And there's going to be no explanation for why he was ever in there. Cause he's never been there before that, that alone. It's like, dude, and they did not even search it. They never searched the God damn murder scene. They're like, yeah, just, 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 she did it. She, it was all her. Okay. One witness named Ryan Nagel, who was the only person that Proctor spoke to who was not related to this clan of people. He goes there to pick up his sister, Julie, who ends up staying there, which I thought was a little weird, but I guess, I don't know. Like you could, it's like, hey, if, if, I, if I go to pick up my sister at a house and then she's like, nah, I'm just going to stay, but like, Bitch, I could be sleeping right now. Why did, why did I come pick you up then? But I guess people changed their mind. I guess it's not that weird. So he was the only witness who had no familiar ties and no reason to frame Karen Reed. He was the only witness that uh, said that Karen Reed dropped off O'Keefe and that he did not see any damage to her vehicle. He heard no screams. He did not see any bodies on the ground. And he did not see her operating the vehicle erratically. He saw her sitting with her hands at 10 and 2. And that uh, he witnessed Karen Reed alone. This directly conflicts with Brian Albert and the McCabe story that O'Keefe never entered the home. Because if she's not in the car, she's, he's not in the ground, he's got to be in the home, right? He's not taking a leak out back. Got to be in the home. Definitely is in the home. Additionally, O'Keefe's phone tracked him walking up and down the stairs, okay, uh, from 1220 to 1232, I believe it says. So I believe he was, the last movement I think they had from him was at 1232, but don't hold me to that. So that he's in the house, there's no doubt about it. O'Keefe took his last steps at 1231. Oh, no, actually... The only statements regarding the events that transpired inside the Alva residence after O'Keefe took his last steps at 1231 are the self-serving statements of Jennifer McCabe, Matthew McCabe, Brian Albert, and his close friend, Brian Higgins. The state police and DA's office deliberately kept all this information from the defense, which seems like a prop, an ethical problem, including Jennifer McCabe's incriminating Google search, which would immediately have ended this from the start. 
Jennifer McCabe's cell phone analysis shows that she left the house at 1.47 a.m. and chose during the middle of a snowstorm to drop off two people near the home of John O'Keefe, who lived at 1 Meadows Avenue. So he lived at the corner of Meadows Avenue and a busier street. So she's like, oh, yeah. Oh, you live near John O'Keefe? I'll give you a ride. Sure. Why did she want to do that? She wanted to see if anything was going on at 1 Meadows Avenue. Were there lights on? Is Karen Reed inside? Where is Karen Reed sleeping? Or is she onto something? Like, how prepared do I need to be tonight for this shit? So, um, she does that. That's weird. At 2.23 a.m. And by the way, why, again, why is she leaving at 147? I thought this was an after party. She's leaving. Okay. At 2.23 a.m., her Apple Watch recorded her going to her bedroom and immediately Googling how long to die in cold at 2.27 a.m. Despite previously telling police that she assumed, okay, this is, this is, this is the red, this is the smoking gun here. Okay. Is that Google search? Because she told police that she thought John O'Keefe was home, that he went home with Karen Reed. So she would have, if his, she would have no idea that his body is in the snow. None. She wants to find out. If this is plot, basically she wants to find out if, if, if we're going to make it look like he died in the snow, how many hours do we have to wait? Right? Cause if it takes five hours, we can't find the body after two. No one's going to believe us. We have to wait this out. That's why she searched that. She wanted to know how much time they had. Obviously, she ain't sleeping that night. So, um, yeah. Why would she Google that if she was home? If, if she thought he was home sleeping, a normal person would just, you know, go to bed. But this woman who spent the night partying decides to pace around the house. The watch has her pacing around the house, just waiting for Karen Reed to contact her and ask, where O'Keefe was. She's just waiting by her phone. Like, when is Karen Reed going to call me? She anticipated this happening despite having no idea that O'Keefe was missing. McCabe waited up for Reed because, number one, she needed to be there to, you know, kind of control the narrative when she found the body. She also, more importantly, had to put it in Karen Reed's head that, did you do this? Maybe you did this. Maybe you didn't. And she's probably like, oh, sweetie, sweetie, it's not your fault. And maybe they thought, maybe they genuinely thought that if they made this look like an accident, Karen Reed wouldn't get arrested. Maybe they thought that. Julie, I'm being told, said that she was spending the night. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's right. Yeah, remember Julie Nagel told her brother who came to pick her up that she's spending the night there. So why did she leave? I mean, you, she, maybe because she witnessed a murder and it, things got a little bit awkward after that. So remember that murder? Like we watched like half an hour ago. Yeah, that was crazy. You got any hot pockets? I got the munchies. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, despite barely knowing Karen Reed, McCabe gleefully jumped in the car with her and Carrie Roberts. For some reason, she's like, miss, find a hoe. This intentional delay guaranteed that O'Keefe would be dead by the time anyone found him. She wants to delay this as long as possible. That's why she Googled how long to die. The longer it took Karen Reed to call, that's why she went to the home. To see if lights were on. She's like, please be sleeping. Please be sleeping. But she wasn't. Because Karen Reed is too smart for them. And she wants to be able to control this narrative. Remember, she initially told the investigators that Karen Reed brought a drink from another bar into the waterfall bar, which only a drunken, low-class individual would do. But this is contrary to Karen Reed's character. Karen Reed's a professor. I believe an accountant. 
She's not the kind of person who brings her own solo cup into a bar because she can't afford to buy a drink. Nevertheless, McCabe successfully had planted the seed that she might have done this. Jennifer McCabe called her sister at 6.07 a.m. and 6.08 a.m. and spoke to someone. Someone answered the call. So it was either Nicole Albert or Brian Albert picks up that phone. Someone answered the phone. This proved that McCabe had made Brian Albert a veteran Boston police officer who has likely seen many dead bodies before that there is a dead body in your yard. Somebody asked, how did you find court docs on this? It's imp- it is for the general public, but I'm turtle boy. You, know, you guys, people don't understand. It's like, I got the sauces, man. I get shit. Other people don't get. That's what makes turtle boy. That's what separates us from the rest. The Boston globe doesn't have these documents. I do. I can get them. Um, but anyway, uh, and that's not to brag. It's just, that's how I do business. So she, this, like the fact that Brian Albert is alerted that there is a dead body on his property. He does not come out of the house. Imagine that. Imagine a veteran police officer is alerted that there is a body in front of his house. And he's like, I'll just stay in here. A little bit cold. A little chilly outside. A little chilly. Doesn't go out like, you need any help? Here's what happened. But, oh, my God. I can't believe it. Like, nothing. Just stays in the house. That's crazy. So, um, a broken cocktail glass was also next to O'Keefe's body, which Canton police initially said was the murder weapon. So can't the police get there? And it seems like they're not in on this. Like they didn't get the, just this like, Oh, well, looks like he was knocked out without glass. But then the narrative, as soon as Proctor gets involved, it quickly turns into Karen Reed did it all. No, it, was, it wasn't a shot glass. It was Karen Reed. Everything was Karen Reed. His body was clearly visible as not much snow had accumulated yet. The other two did not see the body. We stated that already after noticing Albert's, Um, after notifying the Alberts about the dead Boston cop in their property, McCabe Googled, how long does it take to digest food? Because apparently the presence of food particles in a dead person's stomach help pathologists determine time of death. So let's say that Karen Reed packed into him and then he laid there in the snow. Maybe he dies at. 2 30 in the morning but she knows that actually john o'keefe died at 12 30 in the morning so that's she's like already googling that like that's because who do you think told her about that who do you think told her about food particles this was all this all happened at the, the family meeting brian albert he's the one skilled in this shit he's murder police so At this point, Jennifer McCabe was panicking because she knew how suspicious the how long to die in cold Google search was going to be. She's like, oops, shouldn't have done that. So she decides, and I don't know if this is true. I doubt it. Like if you Google how long to die in cold at 227, if you Google that exact same question again at 630, does that erase the 227 one? I don't know how that works. I, I would assume not. I assume Google just tracks everything you do. But she's like, maybe if I do it again, then it won't be as suspicious. Or even better, how about this? What if I get Karen Reed to urge me to do that? That way, it seems like the search I did was organic. That Karen urged me to do it. Right? So she decides that she's going to, you know, try to cover her tracks by Googling the same thing again. Because you might do that. It, you, it would make no sense for her to do that at 227 because she didn't know the body was there, according to her story. But now at 630, she does know the body's there. So it would make sense for her to Google that. 
it would make sense for her to Google that. Except there's just one problem. She spelled it wrong. She didn't spell the fir the first way she spelled it was H O S. How hoss long to die in cold. This time it's how long tie die in kicked. Then again at 624, hoss long to die in cold. So she she I mean, this is wild that she remembered that she spelt how wrong the first time around and got it. I don't know what the this gobbledygook was. She's like, oops, fuck that one up. But this one, she got it exactly the same way as the original one. She later told law enforcement that it was Karen Reed who told her to Google that. Karen then immediately yelled at me two times to Google, how long do you have to be left outside to die from hypothermia? Which would make sense if you're Karen Reed. Right? That's a believable story that Jennifer McCabe is now telling. Right? Because K Karen Reed's freaking out. Oh my God. How long has she been on here? Uh, you know, could he still be alive? Because that's what she's probably thinking at the time. Could he still be alive? Jennifer McCabe knew how devastating it would be if the wrong person in law enforcement discovered this. Thus, in an attempt to deflect suspicion to justify this incredibly, she reverted to blaming everything on Mrs. Reed as usual. Shockingly, in what can only be described as a clear attempt by Miss McCabe to frame Miss Reed, Richard Green's forensic analysis of Jennifer McCabe's phone reveals that McCabe, Miss McCabe, took affirmative steps to delete the 2:27 a.m. search for how long she was cold, but did not attempt to remove the two other subsequent searches that she attributed to Mrs. Reed. So she wanted to, she, the 227 one, she's like, if I, I'll, I'll erase that from my history, but nothing's really erased. But the other two will keep, because we'll say that Karen got me to do those. And that, that'll make sense, man, man. But you know, the irony here, when I thought about that, she didn't even have to do this because it was all getting covered up anyway by Brian Proctor. While this was happening, by the way, she's retweeting fundraisers for John O'Keefe. Sick. Sick. Now, uh, like I said, the motive here, so people are like, what's the motive? Motive's overrated. How about just a fight that went wrong? Just a fight. They didn't mean to do it, but they did it. And he's dead. I don't think there was, I don't think any of these people went into this, like, we're going to murder someone tonight. I don't think that's what their plan was. They didn't have any real reason to want this guy dead, but th they did kill him. Jennifer McCabe would never have been able to cover up this murder without the assistance of law enforcement, despite the fact that it was one of their own who was killed. According to Reed's defense attorneys, um, the original Kent Police Department had been altered, the report. In the alter report, it never stated that the search team found them at 6 p.m. after Trooper Proctor had taken possession of Reed's vehicle. So Proctor takes the car, like immediately goes to the parents' house, allegedly, and notices the car has a broken taillight, he claims. And he, now it's in his possession. We don't know who else had this car. But he's got it. He's got it. And what is alleged to have happened here? The altar report also had different cell phone numbers that McCabe called after finding the body, indicating that the police were taking steps to make sure that Brian Albert was not in any way a suspect. So she changed the phone number for Brian McCabe, I guess, in her phone. Which is wild. New evidence has also shown that Albert rehomed the dog that attacked McCabe. How about this? So in September of 2022, Reed's lawyers publicly accused Albert family in open court of being implicated in the, I don't know how I missed this headline. In open court, they accused the Albert family of, of being involved in this. And they ordered them not to delete everything, not to delete anything. Maybe that's why they didn't delete their Facebooks. Two weeks later, Tim Albert, the meathead moron of the family, posts a meme saying, I stand by my family 100%. Yeah, 
You don't fuck with them. You do? I won't hesitate to make you the most miserable person. Yeah, big tough guy. My family. Well, so that's, I mean, that happened right after that. Right after that. After And so that's that can be taken as a threat to uh, Karen Reed and her attorneys. I would take that as a threat. After being accused in September by Reed's attorneys, Brian Albert immediately decided to sell his home, his childhood home that was in the family for generations. It sold quickly and as a result was never searched by police despite the fact that a Boston cop was probably murdered inside of it. So my question is, is it too late? Is it too late? I'm sure they've cleaned the shit out of that home. By now, they've had over a year to do it. So, like, I don't know. I'm not convinced these guys are going to go to jail. Because what evidence do they have? But I will think, they do know that the that he died in the home. Someone's going to talk, man. Who do you guys think is going to be first to talk in that home? Who's going to be the first to rat? That's my question. I'm guessing it's going to be the two girls, Nagel and her friend. I'm guessing. That would be my first guess. And when they start, once the first name is named, they're all, oh, you know, that's actually a good point, Jennifer. Jennifer. Oh, there's going to be deals. There will be deals here. They are going to divide the shit out of these people. The, they're not going to be friends after this. All this family bullshit. <laughs> when you're facing life in prison, fuck that. They are going to divide and conquer these people and get them to turn on each other. I ain't doing a life bid for you. Now, you can reason... Uh, I talk to some officers... Every single person in that house can be charged with murder. Every, if, if he was killed in that house, which seems like he was, every single person is a joint venturer to murder. When Aaron Hernandez, they don't know who pulled the trigger on Odin Lloyd. I think it's assumed it was Hernandez. Doesn't matter if he pulled the trigger. They're all murderers. They all are joint venturers in a murder. Now the dog is gone, but they found out where it was rehomed to. Now I don't know what they'll be able to do with that. It's been over a year. He's not going to have John's DNA on him anymore, is he? I don't know. So they they sell the home. I mean, come on. They're not even trying to hide it that they did this. I mean, I guess it's it's the smart move if you're them and you're trying to avoid going to prison. But you're also doing something that you know is going to make you look so shady. So even if you aren't arrested for this, you you're, can never show your face in town again. Like you're going to go to places everyone knows you're a murderer now. Everyone knows you're hiding something. You're shady. You cannot be trusted. So, the, But the, none of this happens without Proctor though. Trooper Proctor, who, who failed to speak to key witnesses protected his close friends and never applied for geofence data that would show the identities of every person in the house that night. However, Brian Albert didn't mention until April in front of a grand jury that his dog, that he had brought his aggressive dog down at the party and that the dog did not like strangers. Despite being an after party, everyone at 34 Fairview Ave left an hour after O'Keefe got there. That's weird. They allegedly had no idea that he was dead. So why would they all leave? Things are normal, right? Canton police used red solo cups to store blood evidence at the scene of the crime, which doesn't, I'm not sure about that, but did not discover any pieces of a broken taillight in their first search. So there's no taillight there. So then how did the brake lights get there? How did she break her taillight? Well, there's surveillance video. Uh, and Court TV has a video of this. If you click on that, you can actually see the video. Um, do we have... Let's see. They're going to make me watch a commercial. Okay. They're making me watch a commercial for this. But uh, they... And we'll, we'll look at that video in one sec. 
but it shows her backing into O'Keefe's car and slightly hitting it on her way out to search for him at five, whatever AM. Let me pull this up. Hold on. It's almost up. Okay. Um, so that would certainly explain that. Now, let me actually pull this up. Court TV video. So we can see, have you guys seen this video? You'll see. I mean, she was panicking and drinking. All right. Let's talk about the case that we're talking about tonight, which is in East of evidence. Witnesses told him that take care of the kids. And then she called him 49 times. Where are you? Why aren't you back? She was the one to go back to that uh, residence to look for him. She was the one to find him. She was the one to uh, try and keep him warm and give him CPR and try and revive him. But Norfolk County prosecutors question those actions. They claim voicemails and text messages detail strains in the relationship and the victim's desire to end their relationship, including a voicemail from the night he died in which Reed shit. allegedly told O'Keefe that she hated him. See what I'm saying also, with this bullshit? O'Keefe's niece and See what I'm saying with this bullshit? They're trying to make it seem like they have a they have a script for this. Oh, it's a domestic relationship. Here's what happens. They're mad at each other. It goes too far, blah, blah, blah. So just put the pieces in place. They've already got the script. You just need the piece. Oh, you got a text message saying that? Perfect. Throw that in there. All set. It's like, you know, cookie cutter for how to get somebody on a domestic murder. Nephew who lived with him allegedly told police that the couple fought constantly about the relationship and breaking up before his death. Prosecutors point to a broken taillight on Reed's SUV, pieces of which were allegedly found near O'Keefe's body to suggest she ran her car into him. A forensic pathologist opined that significant blunt force trauma injuries occurred prior to Mr. O'Keefe becoming hypothermic. Blunt force trauma. Cuts and bruises were found so on that means he was alive. head and arm. Somebody being hit by a car, I would submit, does not look like they had been punched out by Mike Tyson. Right, duh. Um, and the victim here looked like he had been punched out by Mike Tyson. Reed's lawyer, David Yanetti. A hard surface for you or me. That yeah. a death at the homeowner and that, that there are some even chain taillight shards that were found at the crime scene. With that, that's what you're alleging. Yeah. This is not me. Okay. Uh, for common as well. I think it was a right. That's, 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 mm -hmm. that's huge. This whole case for the jury. Light. Could Chief dies. Her video from as she pulls away. Oh, here it is. Okay, here we go. And uh, this is all what right. the video. Here, let me get so this is them um, on the night. Notice all the snow. Uh, this is the ring camera footage of it. Here it is, Benny. So she's pulling out in the black SUV. And that's the victim's SUV parked. Ready? Watch this. And the defense says that she makes contact, hits the victim's SUV. Oh, that's definitely contact there. Definitely contact. And I believe that is the same tail light right there, yeah. damaging that back right passenger side tail light. And they also claim you can see, you know, the victim's SUV move, indicating that there was a collision. And then as she pulls away, they say that you can tell there's. So you can see, is anything missing parts of the tail light? Oh yeah, you can see it's definitely less over here. Right, out. but it would have been missing if if it if it was a result right. of striking uh, uh, Officer O'Keefe at that time. Also, here's a closer look at it. Uh, once again, as we're, we're backing up here, keep your, so that's not, you know, she killed a man that tail light looked okay. Like you killed a man. Come on, stop it with that. Try and see if you see any movement here from the other car. Not right there. Yes. You put off. So the judge is going to make the prosecution send the correct. Okay. So. There's that. And let's go back to other shady things that happened here. We're almost done. We're almost done. Um, so uh, how did she break her tail? Well, there's, there's your answer. Okay. Now, how did they find the pieces of the tail late later 
after Canton police did not find any, like, sorry, I saw that taillight in that video. There wasn't that much missing from there. There should not be, you know, shards of taillight all over the place there. So who took the car? Well, Brian Proctor took the car. He confiscated it. And it was in his possession. And we know this guy is no good. We know he's trying to cover for the family. We know he's a liar. We know he's deceitful. We know he has a plan. He's going to protect his friends. Conveniently, um, they appeared after Proctor took Reed's vehicle and state police, perhaps on a hunch, decided to search the area again. Luckily, this time, they found it. Even more remarkably, Canton Police Chief Ken Berkowitz also decided to go to the scene of the crime on a hunch and noticed even more pieces of the taillight from his moving vehicle. How about that? Berkowitz have been called by ATF agent Brian Higgins, who was in the house when O'Keefe was murdered immediately after the killing. So Brian Higgins calls the chief of police up. Why does he do it? And I think he went to the Canton Police Department. To his office. Why do you do that? And now the camp police chief's finding shit. Now the camp police chief's retired. Okay. Trooper Proctor also went out of his way to make sure that Google did not send him all of the geofence data that the defense had requested. So he was, and, and the defense asked Google for shit. And they were like, you never asked for that. There's a miscommunication here. John, Pro uh, John Proctor, that's the guy from The Crucible. Uh, Michael Proctor is not getting that, is not asking for what the defense asked him to ask for. So that's shady. To date, the defense counsel has received neither the automated acknowledgement from Google that would indicate that this amended preservation was ever received nor a confirmation noticing that it complied with the amended request. So, in conclusion here, guys, Karen Reed is a completely innocent woman, isn't she? I mean, I think we can all agree on that. She's wrongly charged by corrupt cops who would see her rot in prison in order to cover up a murder of a fellow officer. I mean, that's freaking evil. I mean, what about the thin blue line? I thought we protected cops. John, John O'Keefe's not a cop. It seems like John O'Keefe wasn't on the hierarchy of cops. Like, it's blue on blue crime here. And that fact, like I said, that these people are willing to let this woman rot in prison, just forget about her and move on with their lives is just shows how callous they are. But they fucked with the wrong woman, didn't they? If she didn't have the resources, then we might not know any of this. She gets some court appointed stooge. Who knows? Trooper Proctor in the DA's office went out of their way to make sure that evidence they knew would exonerate her was never given to her defense team. As a result, the niece and nephew, this is really sad. You know, they believe that she killed their father. And I did not realize until after I wrote this story, uh, how other people believe this too. I've received many messages and I did a blog on this on these messages I'm getting from these people all covering for him. Like that. She did this. Like they don't, they don't even want to think about the possibility that it wasn't her. They have vilified this woman in her head. She is subhuman to them. And they're like, you know, why are you believing these narratives crafted by the defense? Well, because she has a right to be heard too. And their narratives make fuck all more sense than your narratives. Okay. Let's be very clear on that. How do you feel it's okay to spread outrageously harmful claims about a 19 year old kid with no evidence? Okay. Kind of that. How do you feel it's okay to spread out outrageously harmful claims about a 40, whatever, 40 year old woman? With no evidence. <laughs> There's no evidence you did any of this. It's sickening that you will be so willing to destroy an innocent person's life. What do you... Hello, self-awareness. What are you doing to Karen Reed right now, stupid? Jesus, open your... So, who, who should get arrested? I mean, they all can be charged with murder. Every single person in that house, even uh, Nagel... They can all be charged with murder. Of course, you're not going to be. There will be deals. And I'm sure that the police can leverage that to get deals. Okay? And so, actually, the guy who messaged me that says that uh, I'm not arguing that it was Karen Reed. 
I agree she's innocent, but I don't think it was Colin. So who was it, Brian? And I'm sorry if it, it, it happened in the house, which means Colin witnessed it, which means Colin is a joint venturer. They're all murderers. Every single person in that house can be charged with murder. They won't be, and they will leverage that against them. I am sure. You murder for something you didn't do. You ain't gonna take the fall for these people. You ain't gonna talk take the fall for these people. So anyway, um, I think, in my opinion, uh, you know, if if this theory is correct, Brian Albert and Colin uh, Albert were involved with the, then they should be charged with first degree murder. Uh, I don't know what the charge would be from, for Proctor. He obviously was not there that night, but what he did to go out of his way, I mean, the corruption involved in that to wrongly implicate an innocent woman who we knew was innocent for murder in order to cover for his friends, to abuse his office, to abuse his power. Oh, that's a whole different set of charges. Jennifer McCabe was in the house. That's a murder charge if they want it. Co but orchestrating the cover up too. You know? And yeah, like the, the attorneys here, Yanetti and um, Alan Jackson. Dude, they're good. <laughs> like Google them. They did. They, they, you think they're intimidated by some small town Massachusetts selectman cop family. Come on. <laughs> they laugh at that. They're going to eat you townies for lunch. You're done. You're done. I hope they have lawyers. The definitely the, I think any uh, Canton police, the Canton police need a complete duo. I, whoever the, the whistleblowers are from the Canton police department, they should be the chief. And the chief should be setting pins in a bowling alley somewhere for their screw up in this. And Karen Reed, you know, I felt bad for her at first because I'm like, oh man, she probably can't make much money right now. I don't really how uh, she's got a lot of money saved up. She's because she's very frugal, I'm told, and good with finances. But she can't go back to the finance world after this. It's too awkward, right? Too much has happened. But she's not going to have to. Karen Reed is going to be a rich woman. Am I? I think she's going to be a very wealthy woman. And I think that she will be able to dedicate the rest of her life to being a public speaker uh, in order to, she could start a nonprofit, an innocence project kind of thing. Cause how often does this happen, man? That's what, and, and that, and of course, Sue, Sue, Sue for millions, millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars that you're going to get, that you're going to settle. They're not going to take it to court. They're going to settle it. They are going to write you a fat check, state police, local police. District Attorney's Office. Sue them all. They all knew. Sue, definitely, definitely sue the Alberts. Take the, all their assets. Everything. Sue them all. She will never have to work another day in her life again, but I'm sure she'll want to. And I think she can dedicate the rest of her life to being some sort of public speaker or running a nonprofit. See what I'm saying? Counseling people who have been in the same thing. She can use this for good. And from what, from what I hear about this woman, that is her plan. Because Karen Reed is a winner, folks. She's a winner. She's like, a, I, she's a stronger person than me. I would have been depressed and defeated at this point. I mean, I would have fought back. But from what I understand, you even, like, look at her outside the courthouse, how confident she looked. She looked confident, man. She ain't worried about this at all. Every other person, you know, in that house should be charged with obstruction of justice as they witnessed the crime and never reported it and watched and read the newspapers as this innocent woman was charged with manslaughter. Okay. That is the kind of fear that the Alberts in, in, put into these people, which that's going to have to be the defense. I was scared shitless. That's why I said nothing. So peace, turtle riders.